A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the, of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muhadib, then take care that you first place him in his time, born the 57th year of the Padasha Emperor Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Muhadib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caladan and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. From the Manual of Muhadib by Princess Irulan. Welcome to Reading Dune, a podcast where we read Dune by Frank Herbert and talk about it. If you're a Fremen or a first-time reader, this podcast is for you. My name is Caleb Pauls. And I'm Evan Diaz. And together, we're going to read some Dune. Yeah, we are. Man, oof, that music just pumps me, pumps me up. <laughs> Thank you, YouTube Free Library of Music. <laughs> How you doing, Evan? I'm doing pretty good. I am in the middle of uh, an, uh, renovating a 72 RV of a 72 Winnebago right now, so I'm a little tired. Oh, man. 1972 was the time that Frank Herbert uh, actually decided to stop newspaper writing and writing full time. Are you kidding me? No. Nope. That was, okay, that was, listeners, I know this just started. That was not planned. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that literally just happened organically. No, that is, that is prescience right there. It's happening. Wow. Um, so I have read Dune multiple times, um, and I've read the whole series through at least once, I think once, and I'm in, equipped with the Dune Encyclopedia, and i kind of been nerding out about Dune for about a year now. And I said, Evan, you have to read this book. It's blowing my mind. And he was like, I don't know if this is something I really want to do. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's do a podcast. You've never read it. I've read a lot of it. Together, we may be able to have something cool. Right. And that's like, it's pretty exciting for me because like, not only have I not read it, I have no context. Like, I have no idea at all what is happening in this book, what the story is about. Like, somehow I've gotten through life without hearing any whispers about what do I'm assuming there's sand involved at some point. Yes. Um, yes, you're right there. And maybe something about worms but i could i could just be making that up um and <laughs> the the thing is like i know a lot about some other like fictional universes like i know a lot about the lord of the rings i know a lot about the lord of the rings um and an unnecessary know, amount yes right and <laughs> that is debatable um and i also know a lot about the chronicles of narnia and some other stories but like this I have no clue about. So I mean, some people have regarded Dune and Frank Herbert's writing of the Dune universe as the um, Lord of the Rings of science fiction. It really did kick off the genre. Huh. And so I thought you would be perfect for this because I know you're a big nerd like that. Yeah. And I wanted yeah. to walk through it. I mean, yes. I, yes. Yes. So first I want to talk about who Frank Herbert is or was. All right, um, let's do it. So where the do the Frank Herbert relates in an interview that his novel Dune originated when he was supposed to do an article on sand dunes in Oregon, but he got too involved in it and ends up and ended up with reams more raw material than he could ever need for a magazine article. Indeed, he never actually handed in this article, but it served as the seeds for the idea that created Dune. He began researching Dune in 59, 1959, and was able to devote himself more wholeheartedly to his writing career because his wife returned to work full-time as an advertising writer for a department store, so he, and she became the man, main breadwinner during the 60s. Um, Dune took about six years of research, and writing to complete it, and it was much longer than the commercial science fiction at the time. It was published in two parts, comprising of eight installments, the, uh, Dune World in 63 and Prophet of Dune in 65, 
it was rejected by nearly 20 book publishers. And one editor prophetically wow. wrote, I might be making the mistake of the decade, but so Dune originally was published uh, by the Chilton Book Company that was mainly known for auto repair manuals. And it was offered $7,500 for an advance. And so Dune wasn't an immediate bestseller, as you can imagine, from it's in the auto repair aisle of the store. It's kind of hard to find. But in 68, Herbert made about $20,000 from it, which was far more than any science fiction novel had made at the time. Um, but it wasn't enough for him to give full-time writing a try. However, it did open up more doors for him, and he became a educational writer for the Seattle Post Intelligence from 69 to 72, and a lecturer in general studies and interdisciplinary studies at the University of Washington. So, you know, it did a passion project, made some money, and opened up more doors. It wasn't until the end of 1972 that Herbert had retired from newspaper writing and became a full-time science fiction writer. So during the 70s and 80s, he enjoyed a considerable amount of commercial success as a writer. And he then moved to his favorite little point, which was Washington's Olympic Peninsula. His home in Port Townsend on the peninsula was intended to be an ecological demonstration project. During this time, he wrote numerous books and published ecological and philosophical ideas. Frank Herbert was a nerd. That was a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. He was mainly caught up with how the dune, the dunes in Oregon, like how you could like change the planet. And it really got him thinking, what would it look like to change a planet on a massive scale? Hmm. So it kind of got things moving. And it's kind of encouraging for artists like you and me to know that he didn't really make it till way late, but he's still iconic. So there's, there's still time for us. There's still time. We are young, my friend. We are so young. <laughs> so you read the first chapter of Dune, correct? Yes. Cool. This would be really weird if you didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> what did you think of that first chapter? Um, I don't... It, there's not a lot that happens, but the little that does happen... I don't know. The feeling the feeling that I got is like I should know a bunch of history here and I don't. You know? Like there's a bunch of of lore or history or whatever you want to call it that they're already alluding to that I kind of it feels like I just jumped into the middle of something. I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's what's happening here? What's going right. on?" Right. Yeah, like you um, should know what's happening. Right. Um and that Obviously, I'm sure that was on purpose. That <laughs> that wasn't like a mistake, but um, yeah, it was really interesting, and it gave me a like a really cool view of um, what these people are like, like what kind of what their culture is like, at least like a tiny glimpse of it, um, just in the way that they interact with each other, and that's I guess that's my overview of what I thought. I mean. I also have questions. <laughs> there are lots of questions that you should right. be having at this point. So I want to like, let's, let's dive into the chapter. Each Frank Herbert was not known okay. as the most elegant writer. In fact, many literary scholars think his writing is garbage um, because he, a lot of times he, he writes people's thoughts out, which is not really conventional. Um, and he starts each of these chapters with a quote from a history book so like looking back yeah that that was that was like my first question what's with the quotes it's just his writing style he wants to frame this he was into history and like anthropology so like looking back over our lives you know after we've written massive biographies or somebody has written one about us right they're we would have this chapter and it would open and be like, okay, this is what they're about to walk into. So each of these kind of, each quote kind of on a, gives a little hint about what that chapter is about. Okay. So it does, it does kind of give you something. Yes. About, okay. Okay. So let's start with this one. 
A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the, of the B'nai Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muhadib, then take care that you first place him in his time, born the 57th year of the Padasha Emperor Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Muhadib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caladan and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. From the Manual of Muhadib by Princess Irulan. Okay, you just got all up in my second question. <laughs> just, Perfect. How, how do I pronounce all of, all of these things? You know, like, uh, so uh, being, being the Tolkien nerd that I am, when I read like fantasy names and words and stuff like that, I immediately think of like how it would be pronounced in Tolkien's like elvish languages, like Cinder and Quenya. So I'm reading these very eloquent words, maybe a little too eloquently. <laughs> it's so, most definitely probably true. Right. So Muadib. Muadib. That's how you say that. Mu, muha, there's a ha in there? Uh, yeah. Muhadib. Okay. Sure. A, a lot of Frank's writings and uh, I, he, I think you could say a lot of his inspiration comes from like more um, Arabic backgrounds. A lot of, because he was studying ancient religions in, like most ancient religions come from a desert-like place. Gotcha. So this, there, there's a pulling a lot of that. So he's pulling from that. Okay, and the the um, ben, ben, how do I say that? It's the it's the Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserit. Yes. Okay. Some people have claimed that he pulled it from like Jesuit, like Jesuit priests, but I don't know how how true that is. Yeah, that sounds made up. That sounds made up to me. Well, this is science fiction. Most things are made up. <laughs> All right, so let's, I want to take you through the context of where we are in the universe, because I think this will help, because this is a political book as well as a philosophical book. Cool. So this may, we may have some things to talk about here. So first of all, this is in space, right? Humans have found a way to do space travel, interplanetary travel, right? And so we seeded new worlds, and how we did that was, uh, the only government that could really function with this is more of a feudal type government where there's a class system and a ruling leader. And the only way that they kind of found to do space travel is through artificial intelligence, right? Because they're the only one, the machines are the only one that could do the calculations oh. in order to, you know, skip from one spot to another. Well, there was a uh, great revolt Gotcha. That happened. They called it the Butlerian but, but Jihad, um, where they killed all of the thinking machines. And we're going to get into that in the text. So there are no more machines in, the, in this future. And so humans have kind of taken on a new role into how do you augment the human in their natural form to be as self-sufficient and as efficient as possible. So after all the thinking machines have gotcha. so been like no machines like yeah like no machines so we're almost in like a medieval type era oh no but like super high tech in a weird way so interesting yeah it's, it's going it's going to get almost yeah medieval feudal is a good word for it So then, a organization called the Guild, there's my wife walking in the background here, I don't know if you can hear her. <laughs> the Guild has discovered a way to augment the human brain and augment the human experience so they can do the calculations to jump from planet to planet to interplanetary travel. Gotcha. This created a monopoly 
right? Because now they're the only people that can control how people go from one to another. And that's going to give you the context to what the Imperium is. So the Imperium is you have the Emperor, and then you have the Great Houses. So this is going to be our houses we in, in, interact with in the book. So it's the Harkonnen, it's the Atreides, it's these other big families that own, that have a, um, basically a fiefdom or they are part of rulers of a planet, right? And so the goods, how do the goods and planet, goods and services of that planet go to someplace else? They need the guild to get them there. And so what was created was the Chom Company. Chom. And it's going to come up also later in the book. Now, this is all big political playings. Now, Chom has the sole monopoly of all goods and services, kind of runs like the stock market, to which the emperor has a certain percentage, and then all of the great houses in the Lanzarat also have a certain percentage. So it kind of puts a checks and balances system in here. Gotcha. All right, the two silent partners in Chom, make sure everything keeps running the way they are, is you have the guild who controls all of space travel, and the Bene Gesserit. This is the important thing I want to just highlight on right now is the Bene Gesserit and who they are because they are, will be the kind of key makers and you, the first people you kind of meet in the book. Right. They're, um, to put it lightly, they're a sisterhood of space nuns. Okay. With a primary objective to attain further power and influence to help direct humanity along a path of insight and stability. Okay. They're basically there to help the human evolution happen a certain way. Gotcha. That was kind of the vibe that I was getting, but I, again, I had no context and I only right. read the first chapter. So. <laughs> yes. So let's kind of just jump into the book and see what happens first here. Do, 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 do. So enter the Reverend Mother here, right? So if we can imagine we have a, a dark world. So first it says, in a week before the departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurry about had reached nearly an unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to the mother of the boy, Paul. So here we enter the Reverend Mother, and she flies in on a guild ship, enters the castle from a back door, and she's, of course, greeted by the, an old woman was led in by the side door down a vaulted passage by Paul's room, and she was allowed a moment to peer in at him as he lay in his bed. Weird. Very weird. <laughs> and she notices that, and she's now talking to the Lady Jessica, who would be Paul's mother. Right. And she's kind of their... She, they're almost talking back and forth like she's she's the superior and Jessica is the subordinate. Yeah, she's kind of salty. Like, the, <laughs> everything she says is kind of stings. Yes. Something has happened that she's not happy with. And she's here to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and that's Paul. She's here, like, they'll... The Atreides family has now leaving to Arrakis and she needs to go look at this thing that's happened and that thing is Paul. And she notices that he's awake and that he's listening and she just kind of laughs at it like, oh, you're going to need all the wits you can get when you meet if, if once you meet the Gom Jabbar. Gom Jabbar? Yes. That was, okay, that was the one word I didn't pronounce in a fancy way. I was like, what's well, a gom jabber? That's cool. <laughs> the gom jabbar. Gom jabbar. Okay, cool. And of course, this gets Paul's mind spinning. What is this? Is this some um, thing? So is that his mind is kind of set on that. Um, and he's, he's, Paul is kind of taken aback by the way that this reverend mother talked to his mom. Like, Right. She, right. Like he, she kind of talked to Lady Jessica like he was, quote unquote, a serving wench, not a Bene Gesserit lady. Like something is up with this woman. Why is she being so rude to my mom? Doesn't right. she know that she is like 
the Duke's lady. What are you doing? Everyone respects her on this planet. What are you doing? Right. He's just kind of, he mouths her strange words, Gomjabar, Quizrak, Hatterak. There'd been so many things to learn. Arrakis would be a place so different from Caladan that my, Paul's mind whirled with this new knowledge. Arrakis, Dune, desert planet. So Paul's trying to figure out what happens here. So let's just continue reading because then we're going to get into some stuff here. So Thufur Howard, his father's master of assassins, has explained it that their mortal enemies, the Harkonnen, had been on Arrakis 80 years holding the planet in a quasi-fief under the Chome Company contract to mine the geriatric spice melange. Now the Harkonnens were leaving to be replaced by House Atreides in a fife complete, an apparent victory to the Duke Leto. So this now kind of plays into the politics. Right, the Harkonnens were given Arrakis, where they mined the geriatric spice, by the Chome Company. And the Dune Encyclopedia gets into this, that there's a, once um, the Guild in Chome was set up, there's a great convention that was set up that they didn't want to just kill innocent people. So the only way to kind of move up the ladder of the stock market, right, of Chome is to take out other houses. And then you eat up their portion of the company. Okay. So if you were a lower house and you wanted to like move your way up and gain more status, more money in the Chome company or leverage, you would just take out other houses. And the way they did that is they had a master of assassins like club, these mentats, which were trained human supercomputers that you ordered. They were trained in a school and you would get them and they, that they were trained to, the way they would think about things is the way a computer would think about things. Okay. So they, they take information and then they, they, they need as much information as possible to see all the possible avenues. And the Harkonnens and the Atreides had been in this feud and someone had decided that they were, the Harkonnens were going to leave and the Atreides were going to get Arrakis. They were going to have complete control. And Arrakis is the most powerful planet in the Imperium because this is where the spice is mined and found. And we'll get into what spice does later. Okay. It does some weird stuff. <laughs> Sweet. But this also contained the most deadly peril for the Duke Leto was popular among the great houses of the Lanzarad. A popular man arouses the jealousy of the powerful. So this is a trap. I'm just going to lay it out for you. This is a trap. Oh, gosh. I was not ready for a trap. They are walking into a trap, and they all kind of know it because they're hated people. They're hated Harkonnens. Don't give this up easy. And the Duke is well-known and well-liked. There's no way this is going to be easy. So Paul was on edge, to say the least. <clears throat> okay. And let's see. Um, and also, jump in whenever you want to jump in when you see something interesting as we kind of go through this. I'm just learning so much. I, like, read this chapter. I was like, oh, okay, that was easy. But apparently not. <laughs> apparently, there's a world context that i was missing my like third time around i was like holy crap there's a lot like every chapter has a lot of things happening in it that's very needed gotcha so paul sensed his own tensions decided to practice one of his mind body lessons his mother had taught him three quick breaths trigger, triggered responses he fell into floating awareness focusing the conscience aortal del oh, Dil, um, I'm ruining this word and I'm sorry for all my listeners here. Avo <laughs> avoiding the unfocused mechanism of consciousness to be conscious by choice. Blood enriched the swift flooding overload regions. Do not, one does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. Right, he's doing this thing that his mom taught him. And his mom is a B'nai Jesuit. 
and the Bene Gesserit are known for their they the only way I can slightly describe them is they're Jedi Knights. They have learned okay. to flex every look at every nerve ending in their body and control it. So he's doing yeah. things with his body and his breath in order to give a heightened state of awareness. And the Duke and the Dune Encyclopedia has like way too much information on this. Okay. Right. And as the morning comes, Jessica comes in and she's like, hurry, dress. She like gets at all the clothes for him. And then Paul wants to know who this woman is. He says, I dreamed of her once. Who is she? She is my teacher at the Bene Gesserit school. Now she's the emperor truth sayer. And Paul, she hesitated. You must tell her about your dreams. So Jessica probably called her in on this. Like Paul, she's thinking that Paul's having these dreams and her superiors need to know. They need to be alerted to what's happening. I will. Is she the reason we... She kind of knows something weird is going on. Right. She's she's okay. been teaching her son all of the practices that the space nuns were using. Right. Which males don't usually get. Right. <laughs> yes, because nuns are women. All right. Jessica says, she was my teacher at the Jesuit school, right? Um, Paul says, I will. Is she the reason we got Arrakis? Jessica, we did not get Arrakis. So there's this idea that like, Something is happening behind the scenes. Like we were not, this was not a gift given. This is like a tease. Something was like decided in back rooms and this is what happened. We did not win this out. Right. right. Yeah. It w- this isn't a victory. This is something that's happening to us. Kind of yes. that kind of vibe. Oh, for okay. sure. Um, bam. So now we're going to meet the Reverend Mother Gaia Helen Muhammad, and the Gom Jabbar test. All right, so she's waiting in her room. Paul's kind of there or about to come in. Um, The windows on each side overlooking the curving southern bend of the river and the green farmland of the Atreides family holding. But the Reverend Mother ignored the view. It says, remember that Caladan, the planet they're on, is lush water, ocean, forests, the very opposite of what Dune is going to be. Gotcha. She was feeling her age this morning. She blamed it on the space travel and the association with that abominable spacing guild and its secretive ways. But here was a mission that required personal attention from the Bene Gesserit with the sight. Even the Padisha Emperor's truth sayer couldn't evade that responsibility when the duty call came. Damn that Jessica the Reverend Mother thought. She'd only bore us a girl as she was ordered to. Okay. The Bene Gesserit are only supposed to give... They have... Okay. They have worked the evolution and control somehow that they can control every nerve ending in their body as well as their ovaries. Everything. Everything. They can literally control everything. So they're only supposed to have girls. And they, they're, they're in control of that. That was the question I had while I was reading. It was like, like she was ordered to. Like she can just decide that she's going to have a girl. Yeah, she decides. She made, she made a, conscious, a conscious decision to have a boy? Or was yeah. it like an accident? No, it's a conscious decision. Oh. Okay. She's, she's a crazy ninja with her body like, and, and feeling everything and knowing everything. Even down to like her vocal cords, she's been trained in a certain way to detect truth. She's been, you know, trained in a certain way to do all of these these things. Because again, the Bene Gesserit's goal is to ensure the evolution of the human race and like direct them. And they don't do that outright; they do that secondarily. So when the machines stopped being there, the the lords the emperors needed a a a device to tell if people were lying or not but the bananas are fit that role so they just kind of slid into that place of power okay jessica stopped three paces from the chair dropped a small curtsy and 
gentle flick of the left hand along the line of her skirt. Paul gave a short bow his dancing mother had taught him, the one used when in doubt of another station. So Paul is actually kind of a little brat at this point. Like he is the kid of the yeah, Duke on tell. this planet. He, who is this woman, right? He has no clue about who he's talking to. Um, so then what happens is uh, the Reverend Mother needs to uh, give this test to Paul, and so Jessica has to leave. And it's good to know that Jessica's also done this test. Right? She is. She has passed this test before, right. and here we also learn that because um, Paul, of course, gets all snarky with the Reverend Mother saying, why do you talk to, why does one dismiss the Lady Jessica as though she were a serving wench? A smile flicked in the corner of the wrinkled old mouth. The Lady Jessica was my serving wench, lad, for 14 years. And she was a good one. And now you've come here. A voice whipped out at him. Paul found himself obeying before he could think about it. Using the voice on me, he thought. He stopped at her gesture, standing beside her knees. All right, let's talk about the voice. Yeah, what's that about? These are not the droids you're looking for. Oh, okay. like very much that. Like the Bene Gesserit have a way of using their vocal cords to hit a certain resonance with the human brain where weak minded people and mostly and some, some even other Bene Gesserits, if their command of the voice is that good, can make them obey and order people to do things. So it's a it's a vocal control thing. Gotcha. Not a not a thing weird, but you know, like when your wife says something and you just do it. Yeah. Yeah. There are those but, times. But it's, but it's f- for everybody. They have that, that control. And that's actually right. the way that Frank Herbert described it in the interviews. Uh, <laughs> is because people are like, the voice is weird. And he was like, not really. We do it all the time. You just don't recognize it. And that's why it's the voice. Yeah. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> it's the thing we don't talk about. <laughs> See this, she asked, from the folds of her gown. She lifted up a green metal cube about 15 centimeters on each side. She turned it, and Paul saw that one side was open, black, and oddly frightening. No light penetrated that open blackness. Put your right hand in the box, she said. Fear shot through Paul. He started to back away, and the old woman said, Is this how you obey your mother? He looked at her burr bright eyes. Right, so he eventually puts his hand into the box. And as, right. he do, and as he does so, she pulls up. She bends her right hand close to Paul's neck, and he, go, he sees a glint of metal there, and he starts to turn toward it. She said, stop, using the voice again. He swung his attention back to her face. I hold at your neck the gom jabar, she said. So it's like this, uh, like you would think a thimble would be, but with, a, with like a needle on it right yeah. there. He said, so she said, the Gom Jabbar, the high-handed enemy, it's a needle with a drop of poison on the tip. Aha, don't pull away or you'll feel that poison. You know, and then she says, a, a Duke's son most must know about poisons. Because, of course, in this, the way that you would kill somebody in, with the Great Convention is you do it by poison. You do, everything is sly and sneaky. And he's, of course, he would be trained in how to detect for all this stuff. So there's no drive-bys happening. If it would be, it'd be by assassins. Right. Like a so. group of them just rush in. Or the subtle things of like you would pay somebody off to drip something into a cup and then they're dead. Okay, cool. Right. Um, but the thing with the Gom Jabbar is that it only kills animals. So, of course, pride overcomes Paul. You dare suggest a Duke's son is an animal. He demanded, she said, let us say I suggest you may be human. And then they do this test, right? He wants to know if she, is she Harkonnen? Why are you messing with me? And she's like, no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm way above, way above that. Yeah. I'm here to test for something else. And so as the test happens, right, he feels a sensation of like burning under the skin and something like his hands asleep and then it's tingling and like, 
it's, it's this his skin is like peeling off. He feels it. And he, he recites, he recalled the response from the litany of fear that his mother had taught him out of the Bene Gesserit rite. And this thing is just the coolest. I sometimes repeat this to myself. You want to read, you want to read it? Um, no, I want you to read it to me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I feel right. stupid enough without having to read out loud on this podcast. <laughs> I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is a little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. That's heavy. It's so dope. Dude. Right, it's this idea of that anything, anything that's going to come into your mind to say pull out, leave, get away. Right? It says no, 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 no. That if I give in to that little thing right there, that is this small little thread that will pull down everything. Instead, I will let it. I will let it pass over me. I will acknowledge that it's there, and when I turn around, it won't be there. Only I will be there. Dude, that's good juice. That's Dude, good juice. I'm, so sitting, that, I'm, I'm like underlining stuff as we're going through. Oh, for sure. I don't want to forget that. Here in my Kindle, it says that uh, that quote has 5,000 highlighters to it. Wow. <laughs> Everyone just went to town on that quote. It is it's the thing that kind of Dune is known for. Is that Whitney against fear. So his calmness returns. He says, get on with it, old woman. She kind of gets angry at him. And so finally, she says, withdraw your hand, and the Gom de Bar takes you. Understand? And so he wants to know, what's in the box? Pain. Right? He feels the increasing, the tingling on the hand. It gets worse and worse and worse. Right. He says, why are you doing this? To determine if you're human, be silent. There's that salt again. Mm. Right. Like, come on, I'm here to test you. Paul quenched his left hand into a fist and burning sensation increased in the other hand. It burns. Silence. Pain throbbed up his arm. So it's going after it. Pain, the burning. He's, I think, and you can imagine like your flesh just rotting off your hand and you have to keep it in this box. Right, and he can't see his hand. He can't no. see anything that's happening to his hand. He just feels like a ridiculous amount of pain. So yes. he's assuming there's something awful happening inside the box. Right. And the test here is to see if he's, if he's human. Because an animal would pull out of the box, right? To leave, get away, too much pain, go away. But a human, a human waits in the trap. A human waits right. for the person to come and so it can kill the threat to its own kind and thus keep the human species alive. So it's like a, the opposite of what you would think, like it's to, to turn off that animal instinct. Yeah. So finally he says, stop. No woman, child ever withstood that much. I must have wanted you to fail. She is that salt on salt. Yeah. She, so, wait, she, she said stop, right? Yeah. Okay. She leaned back, withdrawing the gom bar from his neck. Take your hand from the box, young human. And look at it like she's decided he's a human. Wow. He fought down an aching shiver, stared at the lightless void where his hand seemed to remain its own violation. Memory of the pain inhibited every movement. Reason told him not to withdraw it from the black stump. Withdraw a black stump from the box. Do it! She demanded. She pulls it away. No mark, no sign of agony, normal hand. Pain by nerve induction, she said. Can't go around maiming potential humans. That's got a point there. Right. So he said, but the pain, pain, she sniffed. Human can override any nerve in the body. So I step in age as her teaching, right? We can, we have the control over our nerves through will or something else. She said, he always said, you did that to my mother once. Ever sift sand through a screen? She asked. Sand through a screen? Like, that's kind of weird. Why would you say that? 
uh, we B'nai Jesuit sift people to find the humans. I observe you in pain, lad. Pain merely the axis of your test. Your mother told you about other ways we are observing you. I can see the signs her teaching in you. Our test is crisis and observation. She heard the confirmation in her voice and said, it's truth. She stared at him. He senses truth. Could he be the one? Could he truly be the one? She extinguished the excitement and reminded herself, hope clouds observation. All right, that's, that's, that's some more good juice right there, hope clouds observation. Oh, right. They, these, these, the B'nai Jesuit also sworn not to love because it clouds the mission. Hmm. It gets in the way. A good B'nai Jesuit goes and like does what she needs to do. Right? Um, where are we going to find? So let's see. The harmonics of an ability confirmed by repeated tests were in his voice. She heard it and said, perhaps you are the Kriswak Hatterach. Sit down. I see, he says, I prefer to stand. He says, she says, my, your mother sat at my feet once. <laughs> I'm not my mother. You hate us a little, huh? She looked toward the door, calling out Jessica. The door flew open. Jessica stood there staring hard at, at the room. Hardness melted from her. She saw Paul and managed a faint smile. Jessica, have you ever stopped at hating me? The old woman asked. I both love you and hate you, Jessica said. The hate? That's from the pain I must never forget. The love, that's just the basic fact, the old woman said, but her voice was gentle. You may come in now, but remain silent. Close the door and mind it that no one interrupts us. So I, I found this out in the, in the Dune Encyclopedia that the Reverend Mother, um, right here, Reverend Helen Guy Mahanam, Mahanam, I'm murdering that name here. She's, <laughs> the names are hard. She's actually Jessica's biological mother. Oh, no So, way. yeah. But the way that the B'nai Jesuit works is that they go off, they get assigned somebody to breed with, right? They're, they have this breeding program that's been happening. So they're trying to collect certain genes from certain people and keep, and like keep those certain genes going because they're trying okay. to, they're trying to make the quiz rock hatterack. Right. And so, um, the B'nai Desert would go, they would be under the service of somebody get pregnant, come back. They, they have a service to do to keep the lines that they want going. So the, the Dune encyclopedia says this, that the quiz rock hatterack means shortening of the way which is the label applied by the Bene Gesserit uh, to the unknown for which they sought a genetic solution, a male Bene Gesserit whose organic mental powers would bridge space and time. The quest for the Kiswark Haderach may have been the longest single-minded project in human history. The, the Bene Gesserit appear to have the oldest continuous purposeful organization, and that purpose was to create a human who could tap both male and female reservoirs of ancestral history. At some point along, along the millennia, the B'nai Gesserit history, their breeding program focused on power, therefore they sought the perfect human, total male as well as total female. They're looking, yeah, they're looking for somebody that can do everything. Gotcha. Um, and so she came here to test, is he the Kizmar Haderach? And the Dune Encyclopedia says that she never actually reveals to any, any of her superiors um, what, how Paul did on his test. Oh, really? Yeah, she never, you never kind of, she kind of like took that one. Hmm, I was doing that out of spite, um, but he, he could possibly be it. Dang. So that kind of gives us kind of what's going on. The old woman who had gained power over him they spoke truth. His mother had undergone the test. There must be a terrible purpose in it. The pain and fear had been terrible. He understood terrible purposes. They drove against all odds. They were their own necessity. Paul felt that he'd been infected with a terrible purpose. So that's kind of preluding about what's about to happen for him. 
is yeah. this, is this terrible purpose and that could be this some would say it's prescience some would say it's there's something he he's seeing something that says something's about to happen right right and so he asks why do you test for humans to set you free free once men turn their thinking over to machines in the hope that they would set them free but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them Thou make thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of the man's mind. Paul quoted right out of the but hair. But hair. Oh my gosh, I'm murdering words at this moment. Right out of the but hair in jihad in the Orange Catholic Bible. Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied with a mentat in your service? I've studied with Thurfur Howitt. The Great Revolt took away a crutch. It forced human minds to develop. Schools were started to train human talents. B'nai Jesuit schools? She nodded. We have, we have two chief survivors of the ancient schools, the B'nai Jesuit and the Spacing Guild. The guild, so we think, emphasizes almost purely on mathematics. The B'nai Jesuit performs another function. Politics, he said. This is where she gets kind of angry. Like, how did you figure all this out? What is happening? Right. Uh, she's almost like angry at this point, but B'nai Jesuit are working politically to put through the genetic lines of every, everything that's happening. Right. They know right. everything. Um, and so now she's kind of talking with him. Paul felt himself coming more and more out of the shock of the test he leveled a measuring stare at her and said, you say maybe I'm the Kisrak Hatterak? What's that? The human gom jabbar? Paul, Jessica said, you mustn't take that tone with. I'll handle this, Jessica, the old woman said. Now, lad, do you know about the truthsayer drug? You take it to improve your ability to detect falsehoods, he said. My mother told me. Have you ever seen truth trends? She shook his head. No, the drug's dangerous, she said. It gives insights, but truth say and gift by the drug. So can, oh, she can look many places in her memory, her body's memory. We look down so many avenues of the past, but only female, oh, only feminine avenues. Okay. Her voice took a note of sadness. Yet there's a place that no truth sayer can see and we're repelled by it, terrorized. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot, into both feminine and masculine pasts. Your kids rock Hatterak? Yes, the one who will be many places at once, the kids rock Hatterak. Many men have tried the drug, so many, but none have succeeded. They tried and failed, all of them? Oh, no. She shook her dead. She, she shook her head. They tried and died. Dun, dun, dun. So it really kind of sets up what, where we're going with this. And there's one thing I want to touch on here is these, this truth saying drug. Now, I don't know if I'm right on this, but this is where when reading everything and while it's going through all the books, this is what I think they're talking about. I think they're talking about the spice. Okay. So how does one become a reverend mother? Right, so the Bene Gesserit have an order to them, right? And so you you start out as so. Say if you were born a Bene Gesserit, the Bene Gesserit would take you, and then you would go into a boarding school, and then you would learn the prana bindu of like how to move certain ways, how to learn, learn certain things. You would work your way up. If you got to the point where you could become a Reverend Mother, you would go through the spice agony. Now the spice. Yeah, when you have questions, just pop in. Okay, cool. I was, I was literally just going to say, okay. So, <laughs> go ahead. So the, the spice is found on arrakis, right? And when you, it's a geriatric spice, so it means it can prolong your life. So I think in the later books, you can see people up to 300 years old. If they, oh. So if they take a certain amount, it can kind of like delay the aging process. Um, it also gives you... It's also extremely addictive. 
So if you get off of it, you die. So okay. Kind of, so it's, it's, it seems cause like the, the, the truth sayer drug just kind of popped up at the, like there was a bunch of stuff that they were talking about and then giving, giving context. And then this just kind of like, Oh, also this thing. Um, out of nowhere. So I, I didn't know if it was another type of test or something that like you take, you take the drug, the thing happens in your brain where you experience things and then you either are just like cool or you're dead. So, yeah. So how, yes. So how the um, B'nai Desiree do a truth sayer, right? Is when you take spice to a certain level, you go through a spice agony. And the only way to kind of get rid of it is to, you basically go into this drug trance as it's described later on in the book. So we'll get there. Um, that you have to choose. And if you, you basically look down all of your genetic line and you have all of those voices and consciousnesses with you, you can either succumb to them and die, which is the majority, or if you have enough training, you've learned to understand where your consciousness lies and you can move on to the next level. So if you are Reverend Mother, you are not only yourself, but you're all of the females that came before you in your genetic line. Wow. So like all the time? Yes. Okay. So when you need a question, you would just go there. Right. And so the voices would pop up every now and again, the guys and he's, he's lying or, Oh, his grandfather did that. You know, like they have that, you have that, that reservoir of information and knowledge always at your fingertips. Always with you. And so she kind of alludes here to the darkness. Um, there's a place that no true sayer can see and we're repelled by it, terrorized. It says that a man will come day and will find, find that inner eye and be able to look into the darkness. That only a man can do it because of certain genetic things. So, that, so they're trying, so the Bene Gesserit are trying to create a hat, Kizrak Hatterak that can do this that can become emperor. This is their plot to be like rule the empire. The B'nai Gesserit. The, so, yes. Okay. So they want to find the qui, uh, quiz rock cataract. Quiz. The, the sounds aren't even in those letters, but okay. <laughs> they, they want to find this guy so that um, they can take over and like be in power. Yes. Okay. This, this is like a thousand year plan multi like ten thousands of years they've been like collecting genes from certain people and putting them over when they found because they're trying to perfectly create this person okay and is everyone aware of this or is this like a conspiracy this would be a cons i want to say it's a conspiracy that the benin desert okay. that's like their primary they have a breeding program it's kind of known that that the Bene Gesserit are prone to liking other people over certain people. But, if, but there's, if you, there's not like a popular understanding of like what their goal is. No, I don't think there is. This is their, this is their secret plan that they've been hatching behind the scenes. And you're going to find that every single major house has a secret plan that they're hatching in order to become gotcha. the emperor. Cool. This is okay. theirs. Sweet. And so that kind of leads us in on what there's so much more we can get into, but I want to kind of, if you have any more questions, I want to kind of stop there because this is the end of chapter one. Right. Um, <laughs> man, I feel like any questions that I would have, I don't even, I can't even formulate. So maybe I'll like write them down and we'll talk about it in the next episode because <laughs> You ju just the context that you gave me for this little tiny chapter that I read already opened up so much. Um, and, and, there, and every chapter is not going to be that intense. We had to go through like the history of the Imperium and the different like factions, but how they all interact will get more and more, I guess, convoluted. And so with this background information, you're going to be able to see a lot of what's happening. Cool. Which is my goal. That's my goal for all the listeners here. If you are reading Dune for the first time and you read this and say, what is happening? How do you say all these words? 
I don't have the right answer. Get the audio book. But <laughs> I can hopefully get some context to what's happening in here because there's a lot happening in these itty bitty chapters. Clearly. And there are things moving in politics and Frank Herbert wants to kind of show off what that looks like. Hmm. Cool. Awesome. So we will catch back up for chapter two where we will no longer be on Caladan. We will be on the planet Harco and meet our evil nemesis, the Harkonnens. Oh, nice. Bum, bum, bum. So if uh, if you have any questions, make sure you, you know, hit us up on email. We have that, I think. Uh, I haven't made one yet, but we're going to after this podcast. (laughs) Uh, As of now, I'm going to try to name it readingdune at gmail.com. Probably have a Twitter profile. I'll probably set that up after this podcast as well. Let's try for Reading Dune. I'll set you up on uh, number two and then episode two if that's changed at all. Yeah. Yeah, we'll let you know when it doesn't work on episode two. <laughs> right. We'll definitely let you know what hopefully what happens. Bum, bum, bum. All right, Evan, it's good to see you, even yeah. if we're in different cities. Yeah. I hope I see you soon. Yeah, for sure. It was a great talk. I'm excited. Remember, come armed with questions. Because hopefully I, I can answer some more. All right, bud. I'll talk to you later. Talk to you later.